Okay. I think I'm now live. Hang on. I've got to put the phone down. Hello. Hi. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I'm, I'm amazed this is working. I'm Cressida Cowell and I am the writer and the illustrator of the How to Train Your Dragon books and the Wizards of Once series. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be here on the At Home with Four Indies Facebook page um, because it's really wonderful, apart from anything else, to be supporting uh, independent bookshops um, at this moment. And so I'm absolutely thrilled to be here um, uh, doing this, this live Facebook event. Thank you for having me on. And I am here in my shed at the bottom of my garden in London. Um, uh, hello, everybody. I can see all your posts coming in. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. Um, uh, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And I'm in the shed at the bottom of my garden in London, where I wrote and illustrated all the How to Train Your Dragon books and all the Wizards of Once series. And um, uh, and I'm, I'm really pleased to be talking to you from here. Um, so uh, I'll answer, get going with the first question already. Um, can you see something? Yes, I think you can. You can see. I hope, yeah, I hope everybody can see me. Okay, I'm going to ask, answer the first question. When did you know you wanted to be a writer? Well, I think I, I'm trying to think back. When I was little, I, um, my handwriting wasn't very good. And my uh, spelling, <laughs> I struggle with the handwriting and spelling. So although I loved books and um, I loved making up stories, I didn't know that I could be a writer. And I think the first time I knew that I wanted to be a writer or that I could be a writer, actually, was when I entered this competition when I was about nine. And um, it was a national competition and I won a prize. And it was about describing this painting and what was going on. And I just made up a story about the painting and who the little boy was. It was a battle scene or something. And it was a big competition uh, run by the National Gallery. And I think that was the first time when I realised oh, it's not just about your handwriting. It's not just about your spelling. It's about your ideas. And so that's why I think that gave me the confidence to think that this might be something that I could be. Um, uh, so... That's why I, I, I judge a lot of competitions, a lot of creative writing competitions, because I know it's very inspiring. And I know that there might be some nine year old out there who might win a competition and think, oh, wow, maybe I could be a writer. Maybe that's something that I could be. Because um, if you're not so good at the handwriting and spelling, it's hard to think that this is something that you could do. So I think that was the first time and that I knew I could be a writer, maybe. I want to say hello to everybody because I can, you can see and hear me. Oh, brilliant. <laughs> I've seen, hello, Carrie Morris. Yes, um, uh, I'm glad you can see and hear me. Um, uh, and the first time I think I knew that that was what I really would love to be if I ever got the chance was when I was reading aloud. I spent a lot of time on this uninhabited island off the west coast of Scotland. Long story. Um, uh and I was reading aloud to my, to entertain, it was Scotland, so it was raining, and I was entertaining uh, my little siblings and cousins by reading them a book aloud. And I remember the book was called The Ogre Downstairs by Diana Wynne-Jones. I remember how amazing I made them laugh and they begged to read the next chapter. And, and I thought, this is what I want to be able to do. I want to be able to get other children as excited about reading as I am and books because I thought the books were magic and I just wanted other children to think that they were magic too and this is what I'm still doing. So that was the first question. By the way in the background there you can see my dog that's Pigeon. I don't know if you can just see she's <laughs> she's fast asleep behind an upturned night fury there in the back there. Hello, hello to Isla, age eight, and Chloe, age six, in Norfolk. This is amazing. 
Oh, and there's lots of people saying how much they like the audio of Wizards of Once. Oh, David Tennant, he is marvellous. <gasps> I was so lucky to get David Tennant reading all the How to Train Your Dragon books and all the Wizards of Once series. The guy is a genius. And he will be reading um, Wizards of Once, not three times. He's reading that as well. He's already done that. And Never and Forever, which is the last one. Um, when did I realise being a writer was going to be a reality? Well, that's a, different, <laughs> that's a different thing. I wanted to be a writer from when I was nine. When did I realise it was going to be a reality? Well, not until I had my first bookshop published when I was about 31. Um, and it, that took quite a long time because I read English at university and I went to art school. And there was quite a lot of time in my 20s when I thought this is just this dream is never going to happen. And um, my first book, I got my first book contract and I um, was just about to have my first child. So it wasn't perfect timing, but life is imperfect. Um, but that and what was it like having your first book published? That was incredible. I'll never, I'll never forget that because if you love books as I do and if that's been your lifelong dream and you suddenly go into a bookshop age 31 and see your book there, there's nothing like that moment. That's one of the happiest moments in my career when I had my first book published. Hello, Isaac and Izzy, age six and seven in the Wirral. Hi, Isaac and Izzy. Oh, there's lots of people saying they're big fans. Thank you, everybody. Sending you lots and lots of love. Um, hope you're all well. Thank you. Um, am I surprised? by the global success of How to Train Your Dragon. Oh my goodness, yes, nobody could be more surprised than I. I was because I just, you know, I was, How to Train Your Dragon wasn't actually my first book. It was in fact, it was, I'd written four or five um, picture books before that. And so, I mean, for it to be so successful, I think this is a really early copy of How to Train Your Dragon. That's How to Train Your Dragon. And it's a book, and the first four or five years of my career, even though I was so excited to be um, being published and everything, I was not this huge, big success. And I often go into schools and say to kids, don't expect, you know, you're going to be immediately a big success. And also don't, don't go into this job for that either, because there's loads of writers who are wonderful and who are amazing writers and who books, whose books are, uh, you know, beautiful and marvellous that don't turn into great big global film franchises. That's not necessarily going to happen. So this is a job that you definitely have to do for the love of it. And then when something like, you know, the global success, I mean, I was I was as surprised as anybody. I mean, How to Train Dragon didn't come out, as I say, up until then. You know, I had been doing, you know, you know people like my books and everything, but this was this was a big success, but it was... It was quite slow. It was not like an overnight. It was one of those things that happened over. Um, it, it built up a fan base. Um, nobody came out and said, "Wow, this is the best book ever." But it meant, lots of people took it to their hearts right from the beginning, um, and it just slowly built and built. And lots of indies supported it right from the beginning. And Waterstones, indies and Waterstones, right from the beginning were very much behind How to Train Your Dragon. Um, but it was not instant global success although we did get a lot of foreign rights right from the beginning we had loads it was went all around the world will the wizard once be made into films too we're hoping so i've um the rights have been bought um, by dreamworks um as well because i love those films i absolutely love the how to train your dragon films um and so you know here's here's hoping i mean films take a long time to make they bought the rights to how to train your dragon in that film um the film rights in about oh, 2000 and 2004 and it didn't come out till 2010 so it, it now uh, um yes oh look it's, oh well done joanna yes joanna harding says she wants to be an author when she grows up you are my idol and that she dressed up as wish for well book day oh um i bet you look great joanna lots and lots of love and oh somebody else is saying that um my books help their son love reading i'm really happy and when i hear that because i try and make the books because i know that children 
it's harder to get them to love reading nowadays because there's such fantastic films and there's such fantastic telly. So that is why I make my books very joyful. I mean, I, I never dumb down, ever. I never dumb down um, because, um, uh, because um, you don't have to dumb down um, because children are so smart. But I do make them very exciting and very funny and fun to read aloud because often children are smarter then their reading ability allows them to access. So that's why I make them so much fun to read aloud. Um, and, and that's why I put in all those pictures, uh, because I think children of today are, are, are very visual. Um, so I get, get them lots of pictures. Now, that was a message from Becky, my publicist. Can I make my phone landscape? I don't think I can, because whenever I do that, it tells me very bossily, I'm going to have a go. No, it tells me I can't do that. I can't rotate my phone. Sorry, Becky. <laughs> I can't. I have to stay in portrait. OK, where are we? OK, now, was it difficult to, um, was it difficult to uh, finish the How to Train Your Dragon series and start another one? Well, yes, it was, because... I had fallen in love with those characters and that world. I'd completely fallen in love with that world. And I, I still love the characters and I still would like to go back into that world. Um, so I found it very hard to leave. Um, and, um, and so re writing Wizards Once, I thought, how am I going to write another book series that I care about as much as I care about the How to Train Your Dragon world? Because I always write from the heart. I always write um, things that, that really mean something to me. And so that's why I decided, I know, I'm going to write about magic. Um, because I always wanted to secretly have a magical power when I was a kid. I bet there's lots of people out there who secretly want that. And so... Um, and so it took me a while before I, 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 I got into the characters and I was, oh my goodness, I fell in love with Wish and Tsar and Bodkin. But, uh, 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 but as soon as I had done, um, I think I enjoyed the series just as much, <laughs> maybe even more, I don't know. Um, but I think unless you love your world, it's very, very hard to write. I can't imagine not um, loving that world. Now... Um, writing about something that I don't love. Oh, somebody's asking about the... Oh, somebody's saying they think the narrator is the spoon. Interesting. Interesting. Guess there. Because I have i don't tell you, this is um, the new book in paper at Wizards Once, not three times, but I don't tell you, just to warn you at the end of this one, who the narrator is. You will find out, however, because I'm always really interested to see your guesses, because I'm I wondering whether I... I've been able to trick you all um, because that you're going to find out at the end, which is Wizards of Nunts, Never and Forever. That is the fourth book. And that's not out till uh, October, September, I think, um, because I haven't finished all the illustrations. All the illustrations are still, look, they're in progress. But maybe because you, for a special treat, I'll show you one. This is one that I was drawing yesterday from Never and Forever. This is specially for you and that is a centaur do you see there's a centaur that appears okay and that was a sneak peek you only get that at home for indies i only did that drawing yesterday um okay so um so i can't tell you oh look lots of people are saying they love wishy spoon i love the spoon i wish i had my own magical spoon i mean wouldn't that be so cool um, I'm looking to see whether I have, I do have some spoons with eyes on them somewhere here, but, um, uh, but yes, you will find out who the narrator is at the end of Wizards of Once, Never and Forever. So many questions coming in. Oh, okay. Um, was it a conscious decision to keep the Wizards of Once series shorter? Well, to be honest, that was partly my husband. My husband has... Is keeps on saying to me, he kept on saying to me when I was writing How to Train Your Dragon, he kept on saying, I mean, you've got all these other worlds that you want to write about and it's taken you 15 years to write How to Train Your Dragon. So the next series has got to be shorter. 
And I said, yes, 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 yes. I, I'll, I'll write just three. <laughs> and, then, and then I went and fell in love with the world. Um, uh, and so I had to write four. But the fourth one is definitely the last one. Um, and I wrote four in the end because I, I needed to get this character Perdita and I need to have Pooks Hill. And it just, I couldn't finish it all in one book um, and tie up Sikrax and Encanzo's story and everything. Anyway, so so I wrote four instead of three. Um, oh, that's nice. We were delighted when you were chosen to be the Children's Laureate in 2019. So was I. Can you tell us about the role and your Ten Commandments for reading? Um, yes, if you go if you go on my Twitter, by the way, and I hope we, I've got it on my Facebook as well. I can't remember now. I'm sure I do. I've got my um, uh, I, I've got my charter, my laureate charter. And that was so important, that charter, because I'm trying to talk about all of these different things um, that need to be in place for you to love reading, for reading to, get, um, to be magic. So there are really important things um, that every child needs. So every child should have a library and a school librarian. They should be able to have access to a bookshop, you know, where, where they can get advice and um, they should be able to own their own book. That's why I'm on the board of World Book Day, because every primary school in the kid in the country gets this special book token that they can, because it's very important for every child to have the right to own their own book, because that's the thing. Reading is magic and magic is for everyone. So I put these 10 points on the charter, which are all of these things. You know, every child should be able to be creative for 15 minutes in every week. Um, and the last one, every child should have the right to have a planet to read on. That's a serious one. Um, so um, these are all very important things that I'm trying to do things in my laureate ship uh, about. Um, so I've got a libraries campaign and a, and a creativity campaign and all of these things. I'm uh, I'm going to try try and tick off everything on the charter, um, it, which was why I was very pleased that they've extended my laureateship because of of all this um, COVID nineteen thing. They've extended it for another year, so I've got more time to carry out my campaigns um, because I'm 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 somebody who loves writing and I love um, writing stories and illustrating, but I want to get kids reading and I want every kid, every kid, not just some kid, um, some kids to have that, um, to be able to um, ha have all the benefits that reading gives. So I want it to be for everyone. So that's an important part of, of why I'm a writer. Oh, lots, lots of people have been commenting on my, my book towers up there. They are held together by magic. Yeah, by magic. Yes. Uh, yes, and somebody, yes, now Browser's Bookshop in Porthmadog would like to ask if the books behind you are your Toria to read during lockdown pile. Actually, no, those aren't. Uh, that pile is in my bedroom. Yeah, my reading um, during lockdown pile. Um, but uh, these are books here, are books that have meant a lot to me. Uh, so, so there's things like The Hobbit and A Wrinkle in Time. I don't know if you could see. Um, but then also... There's books on trees and lots on nature because uh, um, because when I'm writing and illustrating, I'm writing a lot about nature and looking after the environment. That's a lot of the themes in How to Train Your Dragon and in also in um, Wizards of Once. That, that There's a common theme because um, I'm very interested in, in looking after the environment and looking after the wild places of the world and how important that is and, and children's connection with nature. So... I do a lot of, you know, and so I'll have things like British Tree Guide, you see here. And so those are all reference books um, for when I'm writing. But also there'll, there'll be books that meant a lot to me. So there's a copy of Treasure Island up the top there next to There Is No Planet B by Mike Berners-Lee. So th these books in here tend to be not my to read pile, when I'm working pile. Uh, and those are sort of different things. You know, I Am David, which was a wonderful book um, when I was a, a kid. Um, but yeah, my books to read during lockdown. Reading is a fantastic thing to be doing um, when you're in lockdown because reading takes you into other worlds. Reading is magic. Um, so when we're all you know here, um, it's wonderful to be able to open a book. That's why I made... Um, 
you know, there's a spelling book in The Wizards of Once which is magic and it flies like this. It flies like that. Um, and when you... And, and the children often fly on the back of a flying door and that's because a book is like a door to other worlds and you can fly on the back of it to somewhere else. That's why reading is so important um, at, in times like this because um, it takes you, you can journey, it's magic. Um, and it's also the other reason I think that reading is very good in times like this is because it gives you, it's very comforting to have a book um, a ra read aloud to you when you're a kid uh, or even when you're an adult or to read a book. And also the adventures that the children face in the books, they're often facing dangers or they're discovering courage and all of these messages, this wisdom is very important in times like this. I think. Oh, people are saying, do you give books as Christmas presents? Excellent question from Tom Clark. Um, I do give books as Christmas presents. And in fact, I was given, um, that was my favourite present that I, I, presents that I used to, I had a great aunt called Great Aunt Joey. Thank you, Great Aunt Joey, who, who, who gave me books as um, Christmas presents. And she was very good even though I was a, I was a big reader, she was very good at knowing. Um, you know, she she was a big reader herself. So she would, she introduced me to Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which I'd never even heard of. And I remember opening this book on Christmas Day. I suppose I was about eleven, twelve, and just disappearing for the whole of Christmas Day. <laughs> I was at the other end of the galaxy. Yes. Um, so yes, I do give. I think. A, a, a book recommendation is a fantastic Christmas present. My family and I are huge Toothless fans. Could we have one more book featuring his babies? Michael Brown, age 11, from Monmouth. Um, yes, oh, I would love to write another Australian Dragon book. And I sort of have an idea, oh, I have ideas for all of them. I wish I had more time. I will write a 13th book. Um, it's just definitely a question of time. There's so many things to do and not enough time to do them all in. Um, okay, the paperback of Not Three Times has just been published. Can you give me as an outline of the plot? Well, in um, Wizards Once, Not Three Times, Wish and Zar and Bogkin are, they're looking for the ingredient for the spell to get rid of witches and they're flying away on the back of their flying door. And on this very exciting first scene, Queen Sycorax, who is a bit of a one, that Queen Sycorax, um, Wish's mother, has set fire to the Wildwoods. Um, the theme, there's an environmental theme in this, in these books, which is about, you know, are we looking after the forest uh, as much as we should be? Um, and the answer is we're not. <laughs> and so uh, this has often happened, people are setting fire to Wildwoods. So um, they, they're having to fly away on the back of their door and they're, you know, fighting the witches. Um, and um, one of them has to learn how to be a hero in this one. Um, well, I, I'll, I'll give it, it's Bogkin. Bogkin has to learn how to be a hero in this one. This is a very exciting one. And um, so, oh, I, I don't want to give too much away, but one of my favourite characters, apart from the spoon, is Squeeze Juice, and he gets into terrible trouble in this book. I'm so sorry, but not as bad as the trouble. It's very exciting, I hope, this one. Um, and it tells you more about the story behind Sycorax and Incanso, what happened to them. Um, I love that one. I love this one. Okay, right. How often do you write? Every day. Um, I write every day um, because, well, if I'm not touring, obviously, at the moment, at the moment I'm not touring, but uh, I'm doing a lot. I have a YouTube channel, so I'm I'm reading um, aloud Wizards of um, I mean, How to Train a Dragon every day, um, and I'm trying to do talks for um, schools and like for, at the Hay Festival and everything, and still do that on YouTube uh, or, or talks like this, um, so that I'm still going out and talking about books and getting people excited about reading, even though we're still here. So I'm doing that. But when I'm not doing that, I'm always um, either writing it or illustrating. At the moment, I'm illustrating. I showed you this one. I thought maybe I should show you some more. Oh, actually, I'm not sure. I think I haven't opened them yet. I think they've just come back from 
the first batch have been scanned in. I can't teach you anymore, but I'm illustrating at the moment. But I do do that every day. That was a discipline that I got into very when the kids were very young because um, I, I basically, if I wanted to get a book done, <laughs> when, when the children were little, were little, I look back and think, how did that work? I mean, my husband was working for Save the Children, so he was flying off to Ethiopia and all of these places all around the world. And I was trying to write the books and the children were teeny. And, and so I had to be very disciplined. I had to be, you know, the kids went to school. And I was in the shed. I was here writing, drawing, illustrating, because otherwise I'd never have got the book to them. Um, OK. Uh, can you make an epilogue for How to Train Your Dragon? I think I did. That was Joshua. Oh, um, somebody thinks the storyteller is squeeze juice. Hmm. Well, I don't have to see. OK. Um, how has it been having a book published during not lockdown? Well, it's very different because I do love, I love going out there. I have to say, I do miss this. I like meeting everybody. I'm a very... Um, sociable person and I love um, children and so I love hearing their questions and I love meeting families and and seeing that because it's really hard work doing all this I mean it's lovely it's a wonderful job but it's very hard work and so I love meeting the kids and the families and everything and so I, I have to admit I have missed that about lockdown but it's very nice to be have set up the YouTube channel and to still be and I wouldn't normally, you see, for instance, on the YouTube, I'm getting to read aloud How to Train Your Dragon, the whole series, or however far I can get until September. Um, and that's very, that's good fun, because I wouldn't normally be allowed to do that. That's the publishers being very kind and letting me do that, um, uh, just because it's lockdown. So it, there are some good things that um, have happened as well. Um, OK, so what was... Um, has lockdown impacted on your writing? Well, not really, not really. When it first happened, I thought, oh, I've lost more time. I've had more time. I don't know how that is. Time always. Time always. There's always something to do somehow. Um, uh, OK. Oh, there's even more people suggesting who the narrator is. <gasps> the narrator is probably Pentagol, the wizard. Sorry if I spelt his name wrong, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> uh, I'm not saying, I'm not saying. But I'm really interested to see all your guesses. Everybody guesses differently, doesn't it, don't they? Um, who is my favourite character? Characters are favourites are so difficult because I love so many of them and I think you sort of have to I even love some of the baddies um I mean maybe I don't love the witch Excelinor from the How to Train Dragon series she's quite difficult to love um but Alvin I mean he's so awful but he's fun to write um Sycrax is definitely fun to write you're not quite sure whether she's good or bad and could she be better she's kind of splendid though isn't she she's kind of splendid even when she's being awful um, but my favourite characters are always, I mean, I, I love, I love Hiccup from the How to Train Your Dragon because I really admire Hiccup. He stands up for what he believes in, even when it's really difficult. And Wish is quite similar. Wish in Wizards of Once, she's a character who, who goes her own way, who's very, who's very strong, who may not seem strong, but she knows what is right. And I like the characters who know what is right, even in a world where, you know, people, and are prepared where you know where people are doing wrong things like cigarettes and um, setting fire to the forest and wishes prepared to stand up to her mother and say no this is wrong uh and i like those courageous characters and kamikaze from how to train dragon i love kamikaze bog burglars rule um and she's partly because when i was little i wanted more girl heroes who who were just strong and and that's what I'm thinking about when I'm writing Kamikaze or Wish. Um, you know, I'm wanting to write strong, redoubtable female characters. When you visited, oh, oh, Oswestry, you had a tour of the uh, old Oswestry Hill Fort. Yeah, amazing. Ah, oh, history. This is saying, which other hill forts have you visited in the UK? Um, well, I vis visited many um, hill forts because I'm very interested in... Um, in 
in, in Iron Age um, history. Uh, we're surrounded by history in this country and, and um, where Wish lives, have I got a copy of, well, I probably do, oh yeah, hang on, where Wish lives is very much based, this is where Wish lives, um, is in this Iron Age hill fort, yes, that's built on a, uh, based on a real Iron Age hill fort, um, which is called, it's in Dorset. I've now forgotten which one, what the name of it is, that one. Um, but that's a very spectacular one. The, the, the one that inspired me when I was a child that really probably inspired um, Wizards Once because I used to play on it was Trundle Hill in Sussex, um, which, uh, which was just... There was no sign up saying this is a 3,000 years of human history or here. We just used to toboggan down this hill fort, but, um, but it was so huge. And there were lots of legends of giants in that Sussex landscape. And so I used to think maybe a giant had built that hill fort. Um, so that was really the inspiration, that hill fort. But we're surrounded by history here in um, the British, British Isles. We're amazingly lucky. Um, and they're so mysterious, those hill forts. I did lots of research into, into um, real places and real history and real beliefs about magic um, in order to give me ideas for stories. Yeah, and it says that here, La landscape and place play a big part in your books. Do you immerse yourself in landscape during my writing? Yes, I do. And so that was partly why um, I was visiting Oswestry when I was, um, yes. And I do lots of research on uh, online as well into beliefs about magic and and um, and into um, you know if I can't actually get there into history um, because it all gives you ideas for stories. Um, and it, here's somebody now, Christine Edwards is saying, where do you get your inspiration for your characters' names, Zar, etc. Um, so yes. Um, that really started, I like playing games with language. Um, so that's what, you know, you have the Dragonese, um, which is almost like poetry. You're kind of playing games with language. So um, so a, ooh, a, a, a window is an air square in Dragonese. And that makes you think, look at a window in a different kind of a way, because it's kind of a window and it's kind of a square of air. Um, so it's playing games with language and I'm doing the same with the characters names and that actually really did happen in Viking times there really were Vikings called Ivar the Boneless and um, uh, Magnus Barelegs those were real Vikings and, and so that's that's partly that was the inspiration for the for, for the for the characters names that, that almost are very descriptive of what the characters are like Luta Luta you know he's a baddie that's um uh, Zar's older brother. Um, Zar, again, is a game of language. Zar is another name for a king. It can be a king, a, a, a Zar, C-Z-A-R. Um, Zar is also, uh, <laughs> this is a private thing though. This is my son's name is Zani. Um, so his name is a name that begins with an X and doesn't um, because his real name is Alexander. And I wrote that book and dedicated it to him and he was just turning 13 when I wrote the book, and Tsar in, in the book is 13. Um, and that was also a, 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 a homage, really, to a book that I loved when I was a kid called The Thirteen Clocks by James Thurber, where the story has to be saved by a hero whose name begins with an X and doesn't, but no, nobody else other than me knows that. Um, Tsar and Wish is, is because she, Wish is, is quite a powerful name um, because when wish wishes something she has the power to make it happen um, so that's why I named her wish um, and it's also it, it, it sounds a little bit like it almost might be witch um, and she has to work very hard to being good person because she's too powerful to be bad do you sort of mean so um, so it's a lot of playing games with language. Nothing is an accident. Lots of names in, in um, Wizards of Once from Shakespeare or from um, uh, Arthurian legend. Um, so, for instance, um, Calib Caliburn, uh, 
could be a reference to Caliban, who appears in a wonderful play called The Tempest, uh, or it could be a reference to Excalibur. That's also um, uh, a that's a sword in um, in the Arthurian stories, and that's because these are the, these are fairy stories inspired by the British Isles and Arthur and Shakespeare were two um, two stories, but very embedded. You know, they write stories very embedded in British Isles, um, and they're also things that are stories that I happen to admire very much. Oh, can I have a shout out, please? Yes, of course you can. Tom, age 12. Um, oh, Joanna says she doesn't like um, Luther. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Okay, um, can you read us an extract from Not Three Times? <gasps> can I, can I? Okay, let's see. Well, can I? Oh, um, maybe I should just read the bit when they're on the back of the flying door and... Um, oh, yes, they're, oh, oh, yes, they're on the back of the flying door and they've just spotted something. This is Wish and Zar and Bolkin, and they've just spotted something on the ground. And what they don't realise is that they're so concentrating on something on, on, uh, on the ground that they don't realise they're being followed by witches. And the only person who's noticed is the baby who's still in his egg, and he can only say one word, goo. And nobody listens to babies, even when they have something very important to say. So although the baby, this is the baby, jumping up and down on Wish's head, and there's her key. That's her enchanted, that's Wish. I love Wish as a character. Um, that's her enchanted key. That's her enchanted spoon. That's her enchanted fork. And um, there's the baby going, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, please pay attention, because look, look who's those talons are the talons of witches. And the witches, sharpening their talons and hovering not more than 10 feet above the door, grinned at each other. Nasty grins, for witches have nasty senses of humour. How amusing these children were so busy worrying about the danger from below, they were completely ignoring the much more serious danger threatening them from above. Okay. And they were running away from their parents. That would explain why they were out at night. So far away from their tribes, thought the witches and their kinsmen. It wasn't a trap at all. The witches prepared to swoop. And then the witches stiffened as something poked out of the back of witches' waistcoat, swivelling as if sniffing the air and then hopping up onto the top of witches' head to peer over the edge of the door with the others. The something was a spoon and it happened. The enchanted spoon was followed by a key and a fork and a number of little uh, enchanted pins. None of this was odd to the witches. Enchanted objects were perfectly normal back in those days. Oh, I'd love to live back in times where enchanted objects really were perfectly normal, wouldn't you? But these enchanted objects weren't normal at all. They were very odd indeed. These enchanted objects were made out of iron. The witch's eyes blazed red and visible for one horrified moment. It's her, hissed the witches. It's her, the witches growled like dogs. The girl with the magic eye who has magic that works on iron. Oh, so then they start swooping. And that's only the first chapter. <laughs> so that was a bit of an extract. Okay. Mm. The series will conclude in September with Never and Forever. Are you able to give us a sneaky peek at the cover? Oh, I wish I could give you a sneaky peek at the cover because the cover is marvellous, but I don't think I've got that here. Um, oh, sorry about that. Maybe we can post it later. Let's let's post it on Facebook later because I know I have done it. Excuse me, into what it's about. Oh, I don't have time to read from Never and Forever. I don't think. How annoying. Um, uh, but it begins. I'll read very very quickly. It begins this isn't going to help wishes this is never and forever not up till october this isn't going to help wishes fear of very small spaces it begins with them at the bottom of a mine can you see that czar a mile underground at the bottom of a mine and the mine is called the mine of happiness but it's not a mine of happiness at all and again they're still looking for the spell 
to get rid of witches, which they really need. Oh, it's very exciting, this last one. And then you will find out who the narrator is. Emmylou, if you had a dragon, what would you call it and what would it look like? Well, the thing is, I sort of have loads of dragons. Um, I do have loads of dragons um, because I've written about them all. And how would I, I, my dragon has got to be toothless, really. It's got to be toothless. Um, and, um, uh, although I do love Stormfly. I love Kamikaze Stormfly, the mood dragon that changes colour according to its mood. Um, uh, right, okay. And what made you write about dragons? Were you inspired by anything in particular? Well, I was inspired by the idea that dragons really might exist. Um, I grew up in London in a house without a garden, but I spent a lot of time on this uninhabited island off the west coast of Scotland. That's the island um, where I used to spend all summer as a child. And you can see it. it's an island so small that when you stand on the top of it, you can see, see all around you. And um, real Vikings used to live on that island once upon a time because the Vikings invaded Great Britain and they um, and they believed um, in that dragons really existed. Um, so I used to go looking for dragons in the caves because lots of stories on those islands were about dragons. Um, so, yeah, that's where I started writing about dragons when I was little. Um, OK, so um, what are your top tips for writers? Read masses, because reading gives you a, a feel for the way that stories can be told. So that would be my top tip. And practice and try and make yourself laugh or make yourself cry or make yourself think. That's what I'm trying to do in, in my, my books. I'm trying to um, move you. And so try and do that in your writing. And don't worry if you're not finishing all your stories when you're young, um, because um, you, you, you're just practicing at this stage so you're practicing um so as long as you're, you're you're practicing and you're having fun and you're making yourself laugh and you're writing about the things that you want to write about that's the important thing um you know at school you have to learn about spelling and handwriting that's important to learn but you must also learn to write for the joy of it something that you would like to read that would be my top tip um oh and somebody what did somebody else so this so why did I call hiccup hiccup because a hiccup is another name for an accident and at the beginning they think that hiccup is an accident and he's a runt but what they have to learn is that he's the best thing that ever happened to them um, because hiccup is a new kind of a hero he's a hero who thinks his way out of problems he doesn't punch them he's he's a new kind of a hero he's a creative hero I'm very interested in creative heroes like like wish as well who who is a creative person um who and he's also very empathetic she sees things from other people's points of view those are the kind of heroes that i'm interested in clever creative heroes who can see things from each other's point of view okay so what comes first story or illustration say illustrations well I tend to write the story first, but I also, if I come across a new character or a new place in that world, I'll, I'll draw it. Um, or I'll sometimes, if I get stuck, I'll go to that bed where Pigeon, my lovely dog Pigeon, is lying. Um, and, uh, and then I'll sort of start drawing or writing on there, because I find that a very creative place to do thinking. And what's it like working with other illustrators? Neil Layton. Illustrates, illustrates Emily Brown brilliantly. He does my Emily Brown picture books. Well, that's wonderful because, because Neil is a wonderful illustrator and I write the book and then he uh, sort of gives it back to me and it's like having a lovely surprise. If you're working with somebody really brilliant like Neil, um, or indeed uh, with somebody like David Tennant who reads all my books on audio, um, or DreamWorks, a great big film company. If you're working with people who then bring something interesting and different, it's like being given a, a lovely present when you write something and they turn it into something different, but is also, you know, it brings it alive in a different kind of a way. So I love that. Um, OK, 
Okay, so maybe I've got time for just one more question. Ooh, now, Amy Manford, you've got such great questions, guys. If you could add one thing into How to Train Your Dragon, what could it be? The thing is, is that I'm not a really a look back kind of a person. I'm a look forward kind of a person. So I never look back and think, oh, I should have, once a book is done, I mean, I change things along the way all the time. I make them better and I, you know, but once it's done, it's done. I don't look back. The moving, you know, I can't remember. There's a lovely quote about that. Um, the, the moving hand of time moves on or something. Um, anyway, but I suppose what I would do if I thought, and there are still stories to be written in that world, I think I might go back and write them one day. I'd love to find out more about Kamikaze, for example. What's her story? Hmm. There are all sorts of stories that I could write in that world, but then I, I wouldn't change anything. I'd just write more, write more another book set in the world. Um, oh, the only thing that I wish I'd done, actually, now that's a very good question because I suddenly thought of it, is that in the film Hiccup loses his leg and I felt that that was... That was something, that was their idea, and that was a very hiccup -y thing. And actually, I think maybe, uh, you know, that's something that I, I wish I'd thought of, because um, cause I f think that felt very right. Um, can we please see your dog, Pigeon? Well, Pigeon is there. She's right there, but look, she's sleeping. I don't like to disturb her. She's, I wonder what she's dreaming about, but she's having a lovely sleep just there, at the back there. Um, okay, okay, so at home books are saying, oh, books available, folks. Lingham's Book of Books, Bookish and Forum Books or a local indie bookshop. Ah, the moving finger writes and then moves on. Yes, the moving finger writes and then moves on. There's some quote like that. Yeah, I'm going to have to look it up when I've, when I've come off. The moving hand of time moves on and then, yes, but at home where this reminded me the books are available from Lingham's Book of Books um, Bookish and Forum Books or a local indie bookshop really important to support your local, local indie bookshop at the moment because we're all going through tough times and local bookshops are wonderful I found um, at you know giving you recommendations like I, you know, I was talking about Christmas presents earlier on and for going into and saying oh look Pigeon's woken up hello Pigeon Say hello. <laughs> um, uh, so local bookshops are fantastic for, for saying, oh, my kid loved this. You know, what else do you think they'd like? And, uh, and so we need to repay that. You know, we need to, in difficult times, obviously, like we're all going to get, you know, this is, we're all in this um, time. It's really good to try and support um, local bookshops who are, who are going to be finding it tough. Um, so that's why I'm delighted to be doing this event. Um, thank you so much, everybody. And, oh, somebody's telling me, and having writ moves on. The moving hand of time writes, and having writ moves on. Great quote. I think, I'm not quite sure where that's from. Is that, that's a Persian quote. I think that's a Persian quote. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you for all your wonderful questions. Um, and um, it's been lovely, lovely to, lovely to talk um, to you all. Uh, yeah, and the last question was, what, what next after, after never and forever? Mm. Well, I'm going to write a new book series after that. Isn't it exciting? Endings are always sad, but also then you have the, the start of a new beginning. Um, and I love, I'm a hopeful person and I love a new beginning. That's why I like writing for children, because children are so hopeful and so creative. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. I don't like to go. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>